Have you wondered about living elsewhere in your retirement? Well, we have almost daily. No, it's not a simple decision, especially when two people are involved. Hi, this is Gil and Jean of Retire There, a podcast about retirement destinations. We live in Brooklyn, New York. Having grown up and worked in this area of the country, we're hoping to relocate when we're both retired. For us, it's the weather, the chaos, the noise, and the yearning to be near nature and not within three feet of human beings. (laughs) That's right. In February 2020, we embarked on our journey to find that special place. We spent a week in Winter Park, Florida, which is beautiful, but something said it wasn't for us. As we were planning for the next trip, the pandemic arrived. Jean then gave birth. I gave birth? (laughs) To this podcast. With so many baby boomers retiring, many must be relocating. Why not connect with and learn from them? Here's a little background about us. I'm Asian, born in Brazil, and grew up in Flatbush, Brooklyn. I'm an engineer turned attorney turned podcaster. I recently retired from a university career practicing higher education law. I love the academic environment, but it was time to do something else. I no longer have to set an alarm, drive in BQE traffic, or work with people who don't always share the same principles. Ooh, did I just say that? (laughs) You bet I did. I traded all that in to binge crime dramas into the wee hours just a little bit to develop the podcast, to volunteer, practice metalsmithing, tackle our possessions. No regrets so far, Jane. I'm not Asian, and as Gil mentioned, I'm not retired. I'm just plain tired. Born and raised in Long Island, New York, a place I always wanted to leave. I'm a law librarian working in a court who loves his job, but we're retired by the time we select our ideal location. We will be speaking to folks from across the street to across the globe who have moved to their dream venues and more. So please stay tuned and remember... If you know anyone who has moved anywhere for retirement, let us know. Thank you. Bon dia. Today we'll be chatting with Linda Carell, who semi-retired in Porto, Portugal. Porto is a coastal city in northwest Portugal, known for its stately bridges and port wine production. Interestingly, the Maria Pia Bridge was designed by Gustav Eiffel, the designer of the Eiffel Tower. And port wine is not produced in Porto, but in the beautiful Douro Valley, about 50 miles from Porto. Porto Center is a World Heritage Site, and the Sao Bento train station is considered one of the most beautiful train stations in the world. In the medieval Ribeira Riverside District, <laughs> Narrow cobbled streets, wine pass, merchants, houses, and cafes. All right. Many of you listeners know that I was born in Brazil, but that doesn't mean I know European Portuguese. (laughs) Actually, I don't know much of Brazilian Portuguese. (laughs) (laughs) I can say, no fala portuguese. Okay. So the city lies along the Douro River, two miles from the river's mouth on the Atlantic Ocean, and 175 miles north of Lisbon. World famous, again, for its port wine. The city is Portugal's second largest city and is the commercial and industrial center for the zone north of the Mondego River. The population of the metropolitan area has more than doubled in the last 70 years, from 730,000 to 1.73 million people today. I understand that in the last year, expats or people from America actually has grown by 45%. So that's amazing. The city of Porto only has about 210,000 people out of the 1.73 million in the metropolitan area. So this is really interesting. Gene, can you talk about our guest? Sure. Linda was born in Cleveland, Ohio and raised in the suburbs of Cleveland. She attended Purdue University and has held many different jobs, including a position as a police officer. Cool. And her last job in the States was as realtor and property manager. In the last eight years, she's been living in various countries, including Peru, Colombia, and South Korea, teaching English in local schools, and she now continues to teach English online part-time. Her interests include travel, photography, hiking, exploring new places, cultures, and cuisines, reading, seeing friends, walking and trying new restaurants. Now, I want to add, Jane, that she's been to 42 countries, this woman, 
She looks like she's 40 and, and she might be 35, actually. I, you know, I, I lost track, but great skin, Linda, I have to say. <laughs> and she's lived in seven of those countries. Wow. All right. Yeah. And I read that for someone who's afraid of starting out the travel journey. Once she gets there, she's smooth. This is incredible. I That's have like to say. you. Once you get there, you're OK. <laughs> yeah, but I am still a little more of a homebody, you know, <laughs> so I have to get out there. Hello, Linda Carell. <laughs> Welcome to Retire There. You have spent time, as we said, in a number of countries. What made you relocate to Portugal, specifically Porto? Hello, nice to meet you. I was living in Spain for two years before I decided to move to Portugal. I was deciding between the two countries, but found that the visa and residency process for Portugal was much easier so I decided to move to Portugal instead of staying in Spain. And I chose Porto mostly for the weather. I had actually never been to Portugal before I made the decision, but I am not a hot weather person. And Porto in the north is a little colder. I don't do well with extreme heat, which you see in Lisbon and the south. So really, I chose Porto for the, the weather. I wanted a bigger city with more opportunities to, to meet people and experience the culture and activities. And also, I wanted to be close to an airport so I can add to the number of countries that I've visited. Nice, nice. Speaking of airport, where is it and what's the distance from your home to it? It's technically outside of Porto, I believe, in Matosinhos, which is a little city northwest of, of Porto. But public transportation goes to the airport from Porto. From my house, takes about 45 minutes. Wow. And, and you're in the center city? Yes. Not, not the historic center. I'm a little outside of the historic center, but within a 20-minute walk. Okay. okay, great. And and you mentioned the weather for you there. What are the temperatures like there? Well, on the extreme side, heat wise, you can get. Oh, I'm I'm thinking in centigrade. Um, <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. On the extreme side, you can get into the mid to high 30s, but that's not very common. So generally, around 30 degrees Celsius, maybe in the summer. In the winter, maybe single digits or 10 is the coldest. It, it's never cold enough to freeze or to have snow. Oh, nice. Oh, wow. So 30 degrees Celsius for us here in the U.S. is 86. Just want to make clear to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and that's hot for me, man. Yes. It, and Porto, does it feel like a city? It does, for sure. It, it feels like a, a big city, but also a, a small town feel because you do encounter some of the same people and, and can create a sense of community. But it, it's big and there there's so much to do that I feel like I still have months worth of exploring to do. Things like what, when you say things of what to do? Well, there are a lot of parks, there's walking paths along, you have the ocean, you have the river, you're not far from nature outside of Porto, mountains, like you mentioned, the Douro Valley, you can do day trips to many different locations within an hour, hour and a half of oh, wow. Porto. You have beaches, museums, you mm -hmm. have drinking wine, lots of restaurants. Uh, there's just neighborhoods to explore and sites to see. Uh, and it's pretty incredible. Yeah. And we, yeah. Keep, we keep hearing about this festival, which is known as the biggest street festival in the world, St. John. Oh, yes. That's coming up very soon. Oh, so you, have, you haven't experienced it yet? No, the last two years were canceled and I wasn't here last summer. Right, right. So, yes, I'm looking forward to experiencing that. So the night of the 23rd of June oh, um, right. will be an all night party. Wow. They do funny things there. It's believed that basil symbolizes fertility and good health. <laughs> so that's why uh, people put it out in their homes during the festival. And also <laughs> during the festival, people hit each other on the head with hammers, plastic, plastic hammers, plastic hammers, and they wave garlic at each other's faces. Oh, I think vampires do uh, don't like that either. 
you know, the, yeah. the Chinese roll babies on beds. Oh, yeah. You know, to bring fertility. So, for example, when we had our child, my mother took little Max and rolled him on my sister's bed <laughs> and said, you're next. <laughs> and you know what? She had Katie right after that. <laughs> she did. That's right. <laughs> wow. Yeah. OK, great. So there's plenty of recreation. It seems like there's this festival coming up, which I would probably be at the whole time. <laughs> Can you talk to us about housing at this point? You know, how did you find a place, the costs related and so forth? Initially, when I was living in Spain, the borders were closed because of COVID. And so I wasn't even allowed to go into Portugal to look for an apartment. Oh, wow. wow. I looked online and I did hire someone here to help me contact landlords and kind of vet, vet the apartments. And she even went to apartments in person and did video tours for me, helped me negotiate the contract and everything. And now I just moved into a new apartment and it was much easier while I was here. I was able to do it all myself and, and contact landlords, see the properties and, and choose one. So, yeah, the first time there were some added expenses because I had to pay someone to help me. What are the prices like, safe to rent a one or two bedroom? Well, right now there's very high demand for, for housing. Uh -huh. And especially with increase in tourism, there are more tourist housing, like short-term rentals. Sure, sure. So there's very high demand and very low inventory. So we're seeing a surge in prices and a lot of competition. Very hard to find a rental. People are in bidding wars to get apartments oh, wow. in Porto proper in the, the central area, one bedroom apartment. You're looking at a minimum 500 euros, but that would be hard to find these days. And what does that include? Is that a one bedroom you said? That would be a one bedroom, probably furnished but okay. would not include utilities. But you said that would be hard to find. What's a more re realistic price these days? Probably 700 euros. 700. And wow. what about for a two bedroom? Anywhere from 700 to, you can you can pay over a thousand. Sure, sure, sure. Depending, you know, an older building is not going to have heat or air conditioning, will not be well insulated. Mm -hmm. A newer mm -hmm. building within the last 10 years would have these features, but would be on the more expensive side. Right. Okay. And I should add that it's June 12th and the euro is equal to a dollar and five cents. I think it's went up since last week, Jean. It yes. was like 103 or oh, 102. Really? Yeah. Yeah. All right. But we're still, you know, Close, um, yeah. easy to convert during our conversation. And it, it's more favorable now than it was when I moved here last year. Oh, ah. nice. Okay. The and dollar is more favorable. And you had mentioned that the visa was, and we'll come back to more about the cost of living. You said it was easier. I understand from reading that it's less costly to get a Portugal visa than, say, Spain. Is that right? That's correct. You, you have to show more savings or more capital for the, the Spanish visa. I think it's around 25,000 euro, where for Portugal, it's about eight or 9,000 euro. Oh, wow. Okay, good to know. And for Portuguese visa, you do have to show recurring income somehow, either a, a job from outside of Portugal where you're re working remotely or social security or, or some kind of investments where you're receiving income. Yeah. Um, the Spanish non-lucrative visa, you are not allowed to work at all. Oh, okay. wow. What visa are you on? It's called the D7. D is in David, seven. D7, gotcha. So if we can go back to the cost of living for a moment, in terms of, you know, amenities, internet, utilities, can you share what that's like? It depends on the apartment, whether they're provided or not. I live by myself. They are not provided. So I pay myself. Water is pretty inexpensive. I pay 10 to 15 euros per month for water. Okay. Electricity depends on the, the season because sure. I do not have heat or air conditioning. <laughs> mm -hmm. I do have in the winter an uh, electric heater, which takes more electricity. So in the summer, I usually pay about 30 euros a month okay. for electricity. And in the winter, it could be about 70 to 80. 
but I, I've heard of people paying hundreds. Sure. Wow. And then I do not have gas in my building. Okay. Internet, internet's about 30 euros a month. Oh, that's nice. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. And do you, I mean, I know you travel a lot, but what about television or streaming services? Do you have those? Or if you don't, that's fine. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, she doesn't have a television. I don't oh, have nice. A, a lot of people would be happy to hear that. <laughs> you can get a package with, that would include internet television and mobile phone, like a bundle package for right. around maybe 60 euros a month. That's reasonable too. Yeah, it's very yeah. reasonable. So I assume you just use your mobile phone for everything. Mobile phone and my laptop. Yes. Okay. Okay. I mean, more and more people are dropping that landline anyway. It took us a while. Gene <laughs> is like, I don't want to let that go in case of an emergency, you know, and for 30 years, we never needed it. Knock on wood. <laughs> well, I have very limited reasons to make any local phone calls. Sure, sure. It, it's very rare. So I, I use a lot of the services for communicating with friends and family. Yeah. You know, apps. What about language? Do you need to speak? Uh, Portuguese there or can you get away with that? You can get away in most instances with speaking English. Most restaurants, most stores will have somebody that can speak enough English. The younger generation, their English level is very high. That's another benefit with Portugal is mm -hmm. the overall language proficiency in English is higher than in Spain. And, um, and how's your Portuguese? Are you still learning? It's coming along. I, I do speak Spanish, and oh. that has both benefits and drawbacks. Yeah. Sure. Right. Because they're not as similar as people think they are. Mm -hmm. um, it helps understanding a lot of written Portuguese, and the grammar is very similar, but pronunciation is completely different. And I tend to get them confused. We use Spanglish to, <laughs> to talk about the combination of English and Spanish. Uh. Yeah. Here they say portuñol, which is combination of Portuguese and Espanol. Um, <laughs> oh, I like that. <laughs> so, I like that. Portuñol. And I always tell people I, spe I speak excellent portuñol. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's really good to know because I have that's not funny. heard that yet. And we've done a few, more than a few yeah. Portugal episodes. And, and, and Spain I, episodes. Yeah, and Spain episodes. And I, I just learned from you earlier that Google translation is Brazilian Portuguese. So folks know that if you go to <laughs> the Portugal in Europe, well, obviously Portugal, <laughs> it is not the Brazilian one on Google. Okay. Also, also Duolingo, which many people use to practice languages, that's Brazilian Portuguese also. Huh. Oh, I didn't know that's that. That's so interesting. <laughs> I wonder why that is. We'll have to find out. Contact Google, Jean. Put that on the to-do list. What about healthcare? How have, you, how have you found the healthcare over there? Great. Uh, once you get residency in Portugal, you are eligible for the public healthcare system. But before you get residency, you are required to have private healthcare. Mm -hmm. And most people continue to carry the private insurance uh -huh. because one, it's relatively inexpensive, especially coming from the U.S., it's just easier to to get appointments sure. quickly like as a as a foreigner even though i will start paying taxes next year i don't want to burden a system that's already very burdened mm -hmm. and i have not paid into the system yet even though i can go to the public facilities i choose to go to the private oh, that's facilities nice, yeah. and i've had very good experiences with that Okay, so you're happy with the doctors? Did you choose one or, or was it recommended? I chose one. Most doctors do speak quite a bit of English. Mm -hmm. It's fairly easy to communicate. Okay. And what about dental and vision care and all that kind of stuff? I have not tried that yet. Okay. <laughs> but is that under the private as well? Does that cover or no? You can. I also read, I think it was in your article, and by the way, everyone, there's this fabulous article titled, She Left the Country. She knew and created unfamiliar lifestyles in unfamiliar 
places. You could find this article online. Linda has done a fabulous job outlining almost every detail, and some of which we'll cover here for those of you who, like myself, don't like to read much. But this is something you'll enjoy reading because it's important, especially if you're interested in moving abroad. Oh, private insurance doesn't always include pre-existing conditions. But just beware if you're moving abroad and you're getting that, disclose to the insurance company if you have any, I mean, I'm not telling you what to do, but I'm just <laughs> saying know that in advance that it may not cover pre-existing conditions. So if that's important to you, just buy or beware. A lot of the policies here, if you can prove that you've had continuous insurance coverage for, I forget the time frame, but five years before coming here, then pre-existing conditions are covered. Mm-hmm. It also depends on the plan. I think I had to wait 90 days. Uh, Okay. That's great to know, though. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And how long does it take to become a resident? Well, once you get your D7 visa, that allows you to come into the country, and that is good for 120 days. Okay. And the immigration authorities will automatically schedule an appointment in Portugal for you. And it could be within that 120 days, but if they're really busy, it could be even a little longer. <laughs> but you are legal as long as you you have that appointment scheduled. And once you have that appointment, the immigration is called CEF. Once you have that appointment with CEF, you become a resident. Oh, nice. Nice. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, let's move on to something fun. We know Portuguese food is great. But are there a variety of restaurants? For instance, can you get vegetarian food? Yes, that's definitely becoming more popular. Vegetarian, vegan food, Mm -hmm. and Porto being a bigger city, obviously there's a lot of ethnic foods available. So there's a large variety of options here. And and we hear about this lunch special. Do a lot of places have that in in, uh, Porto? Yes, Prato do Dia. Prato do Dia is the plate of the day. And usually you will get soup, a main course, and a drink, and coffee, usually coffee. Everyone drinks coffee after lunch. And it can be anywhere from 5 euro to 10. 5 to 10 is a normal That's range. That's great. And lunch is the biggest meal of the day there, right? Usually? Yes. yes. Okay. And speaking of coffee, Gil loves coffee and coffee shops. Oh, we hear that this Cafe Majestic is considered such an iconic place. What's that like? It's touristy. Ah, <laughs> ah, okay. Absolutely beautiful. It's definitely worth going there just to see it, but much more expensive. In a regular coffee shop, you'll pay 70 or 80 cents for a coffee. <laughs> oh my God. Wow. But in Majestic Cafe, it might be two to three euro. <laughs> Oh, wow. wow. The nerve. <laughs> oh, my goodness. The nerve, man. And and where are you are? Can you walk to a coffee shop? Oh, yes. They're everywhere. This is a very huge coffee culture. Four to five times a day to have a coffee. And their, their coffee is an espresso. It's right. It's not likely that they do offer other other kinds of coffee. But the typical Portuguese person will have an espresso four to five times a day. And those coffee shops have good desserts as well? Yes. And there are many bakeries. There are so many different desserts to try. It's wonderful, but also you have to be a little careful. Yes. yes, yes. I, you know, I have That'd to be tell you, I, yeah, I, I usually will drink a latte or an Americano and just to kind of minimize caffeine, but an espresso, you know, it's like the pure stuff. Having more than, though. yeah, but still having three or four or five a day, how does one sleep? You know, as an insomniac, I probably would just never sleep, right? <laughs> well, it's, not, it's not obligatory, but uh, it's very common. I don't drink coffee at all. Ah. And that is looked at very strangely, but obviously <laughs> acceptable. I'm not the only one. Oh, yeah. This but, one here. This one here. I drink do, tea, though. <laughs> yeah. Do they have tea also? Like, is that prevalent? Uh, not. They do have tea, but you won't find Many varieties in a normal shop. There are some specialty tea shops where you'll find more. Mm, I guess, Jean, you'll have to go down the block. <laughs> but I'll be there all day just chugging along. <laughs> and do they let you sit in the coffee house all day with one coffee or they, they sort of move you out? They generally won't say anything to you. They might not appreciate it. Ah. But they're not very confrontational. So they might not say anything to you, but they won't 
Yeah, they... they... <laughs> oh, yeah. it's because they were... I was wondering, I've uh, given credit to Starbucks here, which allow you know people with laptops to sit there for hours. And by the way, I'd be remiss if I didn't say this. There are plenty of other places in Brooklyn, New York, and I'll specifically say Bay Ridge because I did give Starbucks and Bay Ridge uh, a five-star rating because <laughs> the people don't know. In fact, Gene, yesterday when I was there, mm-hmm. the manager walked by and my friend and I both had our laptops out. Clearly, we were just hanging out for hours and she came by and she said, hello, how are you? So I felt even more encouraged. But there are other shops. That no, again, stuff. again, in, in Bay Ridge, there are quite a few others. But, you know, the others, I just don't feel as comfortable unless I go up to the front and keep buying stuff. So, really? yes. So, well, you don't know. You don't do it. Well, he's, <laughs> by the way, still working. Okay. So I retired six months ago. So and, and Gene doesn't like to hang out anywhere for more than... <laughs> Longer than he's finished eating because he gets antsy (laughs) and and I like to sit there and just sip away nice and slow. I'm sorry. So you were saying generally you can sit at a restaurant for as long as you'd like. They will not bring you your check until you ask for it. So they might not appreciate if you sit there for extended periods of time, but they probably won't say anything to you. Oh, that's interesting. And, and what about tipping? The I know Europeans don't generally tip. Have you been tipping since you're an American? Or how does that work? It's tough. It's hard to not tip just coming from this culture. I it, It's not uncommon to leave a little change if your check is 740 you would leave eight and, and leave the change. Wow. wow that's Something like wow. that. I, I try not to over tip because first of all, Portuguese people don't want to adopt our system yeah. and they don't want us to change their culture. Yeah. And you're going to make them look bad. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And then there's the whole concept of, you know, will the waiters and waitresses start paying more attention to the foreigners, hoping Mm. to get the tips and ignore the Portuguese people. So Ah. I don't want to create that imbalance. Right. At most, it depends on the kind of restaurant too. If it's a traditional Portuguese restaurant, I will leave maybe one euro at the most. But if I'm one that's more geared towards foreigners or in a touristy area, I might leave a little bit more, but I would never tip more than maybe 10%. Oh, okay. 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 That's very good good, to know. And in terms of the diversity of food, how would you describe it? Portuguese food or... Or is more than Portuguese food there? You know, is it diverse? I should start saying. Yes, because... Many cultures are represented here, especially now there are more immigrants. And because it's a touristy city, they're trying to appeal to everyone. So you will find some American style restaurants and a lot of Japanese, Chinese, even some Thai, Vietnamese. You'll have Indian. You have you have a lot of different. Wow. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's great to know. And that's probably mainly because it's a city, right? Probably, probably in the country you won't get that, right? Correct. You might, yeah. you might get some Italian or maybe one, one <laughs> ethnic restaurant. But <laughs> no, if you if you're in small villages, you will only see Portuguese food. Okay. Mm-hmm. So from where you're living, and where specifically, can you give us an idea of the neighborhood? It's called Marques. Okay. Do you need a car or or are you close to um, walking distance to groceries and so forth? I have two small grocery stores within five or 10 minutes, a bigger grocery store about 15 minutes on foot. And I'm also less than 10 minutes to a metro station and buses. So in the city center of Porto, you do not need a car. The public transportation system is fantastic. Okay. Okay. And what do they charge? Do you have a monthly card or what is that? You can get a monthly card for unlimited rides for 40 euros, or you can buy a card where you just add rides to it. It's one euro, 25 cents per ride for, they have a zone system. So the most you would pay would be two euros. Okay. And that unlimited 40 euros, that's for what, what period of time? One month. For a month. Okay. That's good. That's easy. And what does a taxi cost? I don't use taxis. I use either Uber or they have an equivalent Bolt? application called Bolt. Yes. 
And I usually check both of those because they have promotions sure. at any given time. Oh so I, I check both. Sometimes I've, I've ridden for as little as one euro and wow. maybe to the airport would be 15 to 20 euro. Oh, that's great. Oh, at, yeah. That's at, the, great. at the peak, at the peak time, I don't think I've ever paid more than 18 wow. euro to go to the airport. We've gotten this question a number of times. Single women want to know what it's like in different cities. Porto is a good place for single women. Is it if safe? You want to, if you is want, it safe? Oh, yes. Yes. Obviously, anything can happen anywhere, sure, sure. but I feel safe walking around. I'm not a night person, so I'm usually home by 11 anyway, but I feel safe walking around at that time. Oh, that's great. And yeah. did you check whether Porto itself is maybe safer than other equivalent? Well, Lisbon's more touristy, I think, right? So do you think Porto itself feel safer or, or the crime? I mean, I know there's statistics, but... Portugal in general is one of the safest countries in the world. If you look at some statistics, again, things happen here. It's not perfect and sure. things could happen to anyone, but most of the crime you're going to see will be petty theft. Mm -hmm. Pickpocketing, I've heard of cars being broken into or bicycles being stolen, but violent crime is very, very rare. Okay. 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 That's great. I've lived in South Korea, which is very safe. I've lived in Spain, which is very safe. Yeah, I think I feel safer in many other countries than the United States. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. That's good to know. We have single women listeners who wish to move abroad. And that topic has come up yeah. considerably. And I think the men, or single men or couples would also look for that. I mean, I don't think that's, uh, right, right, right. you know, privy to just, to just right, women right. Here. So it's important that I think everyone just use your best judgment and be careful because in these places that we've interviewed, also like Miguel de Allende, that's an area that's very touristy, but we understand that you just have to be careful, you know, carry a, a fanny pack or something where the money's in front of you <laughs> or, or seriously, somewhere I'm where not it's not. I'm carrying any fanny pack though. All right, fine. <laughs> it, it could be a tummy pack, Gene, but you don't want to increase the tummy. So I think it's, you have to be careful as a human being, you know, walk confidently. I mean, I do that all the time just to kind of make yourself less uh, vulnerable, right? Yes. And because Bolts and Ubers are so inexpensive here, if you are ever feeling like you don't want to be out by yourself at night, just order a car. Right. And if you order it, at least you know it's coming from a company rather than waving something down. Right. Yes? Yeah. I don't hear about the kinds of attacks that you've heard about in the United States. I don't know if it's happened here or not, but... It's, it's definitely not as common. Yeah, yeah. It's not front page news, that's for sure. So what about, have you been, have you felt you've been welcomed by the locals? They've been very friendly. That's another plus on the Portugal versus Spain side is the, the people here in general are very, very friendly and welcoming, especially if you try to speak a little Portuguese. Sure. They absolutely love it. They do not like like. When people just start speaking Spanish, assuming that <laughs> that they will understand. They'd rather have English than Spanish. Sure. But if you try and speak Portuguese, they're fantastic. And in general, you go into a restaurant or a shop or a museum, and people are very welcoming and friendly and helpful, even at the bus stop or the train station if you need help. Figuring out how to buy a ticket, someone will be more than happy to help you. Oh, wow. That's okay. great. So while you've been in Porto, what have you enjoyed on a daily basis? Give us a, a day in the life of Linda Carell. <laughs> well, I still do work part-time. So sometimes I'll work in the morning for three or four hours. If I don't work, you do a lot of normal things like going to the grocery store and doing laundry and cleaning your house. You still have to do those things. So oh, shucks. <laughs> <laughs> living abroad isn't all fun and games, but mm -hmm. I have a lot of free time. So I might meet up with some people that I've met. We go for coffee, go for lunch. I might pick a new neighborhood and just 
go and walk around. Right. I might go to the river or to the ocean and just oh. just enjoy the scenery and the the atmosphere. There's endless yeah. things to do. Yeah. And, and was it easy to make friends? It's fairly easy. There are Facebook groups, a lot of Facebook groups for every city, every country around the world, really. If you're if you're going to any country, just search the city or the country and the word expat or immigrant and you'll find Facebook groups. And it's a great way to meet people, find out about events. There are a lot of co working spaces in oh. Porto. Ah. Oh, I like that. Often they have events in the evening. And if you have a hobby, you'll most likely find a Facebook group with that hobby. I'm in a hiking group. Nice. And I've been on about five or six hikes with the group. And there are usually people from maybe eight to ten different countries. Wow. Wow. Nice. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not just Americans. Mm -hmm. There are, are a lot of other foreigners here. So there's plenty of opportunity to meet people. Hike. How long does it take you to get to uh, like a park or somewhere to hike? It can be as little as a half an hour. Or Portugal only has one official national park. Mm-hmm. And it's an hour, 15 minutes to an hour and a half from Porto by car. I've been there twice. So with the hiking group, most of the time you do need a car. But anyone who has a car will offer to take people. That's nice. We, that we nice. just pay five euro or 10 euro to help with the, the expenses of gas and yeah. toll. Uh, but I've always been able to find a ride with someone when I've wanted to go on a hike. And a distance to the oceans by you, how long is that? By bus or metro, it would be about 40 to 45 minutes. Okay. Wow. So you're like centrally located, which is great. So there is a metro there in, in your city. How How is the metro? Great. It's on time, it's clean, mm-hmm. it's safe, it's not expensive. It between the metros and the buses, you can get anywhere. And they, but they don't have trolleys like they have in Lisbon, right? They do have trolleys. Oh. Uh, I have not taken one because it's pretty touristy. Ah, okay. <laughs> I guess from the center of the historic distance to I, I don't know how far they I don't know if they go all the way to the mm-hmm. ocean sure, sure. or or just part way. I, I think it's most it's not really for getting places, it's more just for the experience of riding it. Sure, sure. Mm-hmm. So I read in your article that one of the best lessons you've learned is from your grandmother, right? That after she finished university in the 30s, she wanted to move to New York City as a single woman in her 20s. And her father told her, go. The train travels in both directions. Take those chances. You can always return to where you were or head in a new direction if you're not satisfied. Oh, that's great. Wow. I, I just, I just love that. Yeah. Did that trickle down to you? Did the family feel the same way? You know, how's that been? I did not learn traveling from my family. I was... <laughs> I was a late bloomer to traveling, and I picked it up later in life, actually. But I always remember that story, and it stuck with me that you can go somewhere. If it doesn't work out, you can come home or try something else. Yeah, I think that's so, that's so yeah, right, that. it, Gene? Yeah, there's, you know, just, just not, let the person know. Yeah. Stuck. You're not stuck somewhere. Yeah. Right. You're never stuck anywhere. I was the oldest of seven kids. We were immigrants when it was time to go to college. And not that I necessarily knew what I was doing. My father preempted by saying, you're not leaving home. And, you know, friends were going to different places. And I thought, oh, wow. So I just kind of followed my boyfriend. And he went to the College of Staten Island, which is right across the bridge, Gene, <laughs> from where we are. And that's what I did. I can't imagine if I, I wasn't. You didn't fight him. I didn't a, fight him because, <laughs> no, no, I, I don't think I focused on that or I just didn't really take advantage or avail myself of college counseling. I mean, I went to a, a, one of the top high schools, but I just, I don't know. I, w- I was just not very bright. Or adventurous at the time. So I, I didn't fight it. I don't think for I mean, I know for certain he wouldn't have let me go outside the country. Um, part of that, I think part of that is the Asian culture that after you graduate, you work and help out the home. So you're not going anywhere unless you're wealthy. But again, as the oldest of seven, my underlings certainly went all over. 
And that became the norm, actually. For someone in the 20s and the 30s, like your grandmother, especially a woman, that was really open-minded. Open-minded, progressive. Well, progressive, her, father, yeah. her father had was born in what is now Latvia, but it was USSR at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he escaped. Ah, he escaped. Ah to go to the U.S. when Russia was um, conscripting people into the military. So as he was turning 18, he escaped the country. So I think he just had that spirit in him from his experiences. But the fact that he, he instilled that in, he had two daughters, and he instilled that in women at the time was pretty progressive. Yeah, I'll say. Do you go back to the U.S. often? I mean, you've been out of the country for so long. Do you come back often or what? I try not to, but <laughs> <laughs> my father's still around, so I do feel uh -huh. obligated to, to visit him. Yeah. I do miss family and friends, so once or twice a year. Okay, uh, okay. And I is there any kind of yearning for any U.S. culture or places? I miss some foods. Like, like what? what? <laughs> pizza dill pickles kosher dill pickles dill pickles, <laughs> dill pickles. and <laughs> chicago hot dogs oh chicago yeah. hot dogs you know i don't think i had one when Same i was with all there. the, the, the all peppers the stuff and stuff on, on them yeah okay um but not much especially now i'm in a bigger city i can get tastes of food when i first moved abroad was living in places that had no food variety. I was craving a lot more foods, but now, now I feel pretty satisfied. Yeah. Can, can you eat out pretty much during the week, not worry about the cost too much? Yes. Yes. I probably eat out three times a week. Nice. And but I could do more if I wanted to. And how are the, um, the markets there, the food stores? Great. You have what they call hypermarket, like hypermarket, which is would be our equivalent of a, a Target or a Kmart or Walmart where you can find food and clothing and household oh, goods. Wow. They do have those here. They're a little harder to get to. Mm -hmm. okay. um, they have full-size supermarkets, and then they ha you have your local markets. One thing here is you'll find a market that's just a butcher shop. You'll have a fruit and vegetable market, so a lot of specialty shops. And uh, we always hear the fruit and vegetables are fresh over there. Is that the case, you think? They are. Yeah. And they're not going to be as pretty as we're used to. They don't really um, put an emphasis on, on the appearance. Mm -hmm. They right. just want the freshness. Yeah, yeah. Just pull it out of the ground. You don't need to <laughs> flush it down or put any pesticides or any of that junk on it. Yeah, They do, they do use pesticides, but... Mm -hmm. Definitely, there are, there are a lot more laws and rules in the EU about chemicals and preservatives in foods. Yeah, I do have um, an important question or important to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Recycling, keeping our earth clean. Yes. What are the efforts like in Porto or in, in Portugal? Are there less use of, you know, one use plastics? And what, what does that feel like? There's still plenty of plastics being used. But they do charge for any bag you get at the supermarket or any store. You are charged for a bag, whether it's paper or plastic. So more people use re reusable bags here. And then on the streets, there are a lot of recycling bins. When you take, you have to take out your garbage to a, a central location on your street or, or somewhere close by your home. And they have one bin for paper, one bin for glass, one bin for plastic, and then regular garbage. So it's very normal for Portuguese families or, or anyone living here to separate the garbage and, and put it in the correct bin. Wow, I love that. So you actually have to go out of the house. And is it standard to have a washer and dryer in your apartment or in your building? It's standard to have a washer actually in... Every country I've lived in, it's very rare to have a dryer. Okay. Oh. They are available here, but because electricity is relatively expensive, especially for the Portuguese on their salary, they're not going to use a dryer. When you have sun and wind, 
to dry your clothing for you. So you see the the clothes hanging outside the building. I love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but most people have washers in their home. There are a lot of laundromats around also. Oh, okay. So and- I do know people who have t- washed their clothes at home and taken them to the laundromat to dry because in the winter, if it's damp oh, yeah. Or, yeah. or raining, things, <laughs> things can take a while to dry. So some people will run to the laundromat and dry their clothes. And just generally, so you've been there uh, for less than a year. You've been in Porto. Do you love it? I do love it. Oh, that's and great. I'm not sure if it's because I'm not working outside <laughs> home anymore. Yeah. I'm working at home. I'm working a lot less than normal. So I have a lot of free time. I'm having a lot of fun. But also the city is very special because it's beautiful. The architecture, you you have a mix of like of building types. You have you know, historic buildings, you have the really ugly 60s and 70s architecture, <laughs> Unfortunately. you have art deco, you mm. have modern yeah. mix, it, it's history. Porto is actually older than Lisbon because ah. Lisbon had an earthquake in the yes. 1700s. They had to rebuild the city yep. then. Uh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Porto, the, the buildings are actually older and more a little more gritty. But I like that because it adds a lot of character to the city. Yeah. They've really cleaned up the, the center, the historic center. A lot of the locals say just 15, 20 years ago, it was almost all abandoned. It was fairly dangerous, I guess, relatively speaking. Nobody wanted to be in the historic center. And finally, people saw the value and started buying these properties to invest in and just within a short period of time, it's it's completely changed. It's wow. amazing. I think we've covered um, a ton, but I think this was an excellent episode, if I say so myself. <laughs> um, Linda, you have been a fabulous guest. W- what you. advice, if any, do you have for those who are, you know, a little fearful of taking that step? I know you mentioned that anytime you go somewhere else, there's always that you know, little intimidation. Uh, What advice would you give to others who's interested in doing this? Sure. Definitely. Maybe not like me. Go visit places before (laughs) you make these decisions and you can meet people while you're there and start building connections. Join these Facebook groups and, and so much information is in these groups and shared. People are very happy to help and, and give advice. You're not alone and you don't have to figure everything out. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. It's already invented. You just have to find the information. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so we have one more imposition for you and I will be quiet. And that is <laughs> when you get a chance... If you could uh, send us some shots, you know, we're on Instagram for any of those folks who do visit occasionally. It's growing. We're on Instagram at at retired there and retired there underscore. We're on Twitter and we can take up to 10 photos on Instagram. On Facebook, we could take hundreds, but I don't want you to spend your life doing that. If you can give us a sense of Porto. Uh, maybe some favorite places you like, but only if it's convenient for you, if you're yeah, out there walking out your around, way. yeah, you know, like around where you live and, and that kind of thing. That would be wonderful. We'd really appreciate it. I have a lot of pictures. <laughs> <laughs> and, and a picture of you too. Yeah. And a photo of you because you're gorgeous. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Okay. I don't have, a, I don't take a lot of pictures of myself, but I do have one from Portugal that I can send you. Okay. Thank Sounds you. good. Sounds good. All right, then. Well, thank you so, All so right. much. Enjoyed thank meeting you. Yeah, thank you so much. This is great. Yeah, great. All right. Let me know, let me know if you come visit. <laughs> we'll do. Oh, we'll we, do. Be All afraid. Right. Be very afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, be afraid of him. Okay, <laughs> yeah. he'll he'll ask you a million questions. I'll be the one. I'll be the one sleeping till noon and say, "Oh, what are we going to eat?" Yeah. All right. All right. Listen. Thank take you. care. Bye. Be well. Bye bye. Okay. Bye. bye. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you know someone who's relocated for retirement and wishes to share their story with us, please reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. Our email address is gg at retiredthere.com. Our website is retiredthere.com, and you may follow us on Twitter at retiredthere underscore. Now, if you've liked our show, please subscribe and rate it in Apple Podcasts. 
In the meantime, be well. Be well.